Okay, it's showing that we're live. I'm gonna go ahead and refresh the page to make sure it's so, working. Where are we on YouTube or Facebook? YouTube. Uh huh. Yeah, so it'll be available to watch um, after we're live. It'll save us a video on my channel. So cool. I can send you the link after if you want. Cool. Well, good evening, or not good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Um, hope everyone's having a great day. Welcome to Chit Chat and Geek Out. I'm your host, Steven, and today on the show, we have John Capellos um, from movies and television shows um, such as The Breakfast Club, The Shape of Water, um, Suits, just to name a few. Um, he's been on many, many great movies and television series. Um, thank you for being here today, John. How are you? I'm really good. I'm, uh, it's actually the morning here, so good morning. Good morning. Yeah, oh, it's uh, yeah. It's kind it's of rainy in California. Oh yeah, nice. You're in California, that's right. That's true. It's You're rainy. three hours behind me right now. Yeah. So good morning. I actually uh, visited California last year in February. Nice place. It was very fun and nice weather. I went in the winter time here in Canada, so it was a nice getaway because the weather is so beautiful there. Well, that's why I encourage everybody when they come to California from the east or the uh, from Canada or the Midwest, <laughs> come in January or February when it's kind of, now I just see on the news today that, uh, or in the weather, that, that you're gonna, guys are gonna get that cold blast. And I'm, yeah, I'm gonna, we're, we're expecting some more snowstorms, which is unfortunate because I'm getting tired of them. <laughs> we haven't been having a lot the past few weeks, I would say now. Well, it's really been um, a strange, winter here in california because in february we didn't get one now i'm speaking in fahrenheit for our canadian viewers um we didn't get one day into the 70s in la <laughs> so wow. that which is a record since 1960 or something so but wow. you know the, weather, the weather's the weather bro it is you never know what mother nature's gonna do no <laughs> And um, I'm seeing some people here in the chat. Um, if you guys have any questions uh, for John, please just let me know. We'll get your questions at some point of the interview. Um, we're going to go ahead and kick off this interview um, by, um, I want to ask you, John, um, what are some upcoming projects projects you have? I know recently uh, you've been announced to do an episode um, to be on Crossword Mysteries um, that will be premiering later this month. Um, anything else new with you and new projects coming up? Well, Crossword Mysteries actually will be on this coming Sunday, so the 10th. Um, so that's what's happening there. And it is a new Hallmark Movie of the Week thing. And mm -hmm. I play um, the, uh, the one of the detective's fathers, and I'm also a detective. So I play a, <laughs> a dad whose son is a detective, right? Normally my... Now I'm sort of moving into having grown up kids as as uh, right. kids on TV, and then uh, I'm in a really funny, funny, funny movie called The Unicorn, with um, a great cast, uh, directed by Robert Schwartzman, who's Jason Schwartzman's brother. Oh, nice! And it's a funny film that's out in limited release. I don't know where it's playing locally in Toronto, or in Stouffville, or wherever people are gathered. I know it's playing in and around Los Angeles at selected theaters, and I think around the country. It's called The oh, Unicorn. Nice. And um, if you check it out, cast is really, really good. Uh, Nick Rutherford and, um, uh, you know, just just a really funny group of people and really, you know, too numerous to mention because if I don't, I just mentioned Nick, but. Right. Um, like that. And then also another movie called Love Shot, which is now available on iTunes, on iTunes, Love Shot. And it is um, a dark comedy. And um, I executive produced it as well as acted in it. And also um, have a tune in the, oh, wow. somewhere at the, at the end of the, the film. And um, what else? And my album, mm -hmm. which has been out. And I'm uh, performing next weekend. Nice, very cool, where are you performing at? At a place called Vitello's here in Los Angeles, which is a, a restaurant, um, sort of, they have this upstairs jazz club, so you have dinner and then you watch, listen to some jazz. And nice, and yeah, you just came out with your album, Two Hit For The Room, last year. 
and you're mm-hmm. starting for this year. Um, were you always into jazz, or was it just something new that you wanted to try? Or Well, I mean, I've always been into sort of music. So um, to do a jazz album has been something that I've kind of worked up to. And um, I wouldn't say I'm... I wouldn't say I'm a jazz musician. I'm a person who loves jazz, and I wouldn't say I'm a jazz singer. I'm a person that uh, loves to sing. Right. So uh, whether I can sing jazz or not, um, that time will tell. And it's also something that you learn. I mean, you think you can do things, and then you try them, and you go, "Okay, well, there's a learning curve here." Right. I mean, I mean, this this is if you you know have the aptitude to do them. So um, you know, you can sing in the choir. Which I did growing up, or you can sing rock, or you can sing at Second City, which I did. But uh, singing jazz is its is is its own animal. So yeah, um, right now I'm singing that. Very cool, awesome. But it, it's not uh, it's not you know it's pretty. Um, how should I say? It's kind of nerve wracking. <laughs> <laughs> because um, I'm singing, I'm going to be singing next weekend with an 18 piece big band. So wow, you know, there's a lot of room for. For me to screw up with like eighteen hard charging professionals. Yeah, no, I, I get I get your drift there. It could be uh, quite overwhelming there, but I'm yeah. sure you'll do fine. And um, everybody that's watching, that's why I'm nursing I'm... my voice here with um, hot hot tea. Oh. <laughs> um, for everyone that's watching, where can people listen to your music and purchase your album? My album is available on iTunes course and spotify and apple music and so itunes in canada us england and australia Um, not uh, not in europe and i cover uh don't you forget about me the song from the breakfast club yes i saw that that was amazing and then most of the songs are kind of i would say in the humorous um slash uh satiric vein um but you know, it's stuff that I've done, so you, it bears repeated listening because, you know, right. a lot of ha-ha funny songs, and I don't know whether these are exactly ha-ha funny songs, but a lot of them really um, get tired after one or two listenings, and that's something that I did not want to happen, so. Right. Wow. Yeah, I feel like that happens quite often. <laughs> like, you, you don't want to hear the same songs all the time, but I mean... Um... You know, I've listened to some of your album, and it, it they're very different, all, all the songs, and um, easy listening to, um, all the jazz and whatnot, but it's really enjoyable, easy listening, be nice for like a dinner party. It's humor, too. There's some humor in there. Yeah, so. and, um, you know, you use the term easy listening, which is actually, when I was growing up, was a section in the music store where they had Muzak. So I'll take what you're saying is a compliment, but... In, in, in effect, I mean, it is music that is it is relaxing and got, you know, some of it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> some of it's a bit um, out there. But, um, you know, it's it's made to be listened to. So, right. Um, a lot of music is background music, and sometimes mine can be uh, edged into the background, but then it sort of, when people hear what's going on, they sort of listen and it sort of becomes edges into the foreground. So, very cool. Well, definitely, everybody go check out his new album and check out his tour dates. Um, is there a place that people can see your tour dates, or um, is no? Um, well, actually, I don't have any tour dates lined up, uh, so that's cute of you to say that. Um, it's um, you're making me out to be like you know, <laughs> uh, Cardi B on the, on the road, <laughs> which a thousand years away from that. Um, I'm hoping that, um once we sort of get this show together, and the reason why we're doing this is because I'm working with a guy, a wonderful guy who's, and I have collaborated with a guy named Jeff Stradling, and he's got a great band. So maybe what we can do is hit jazz festivals, Toronto, Vancouver, nice. um, you know, Miami, <laughs> wherever That's a good fun. jazz festival is located, like that. Right. Well, if you come to Toronto, I'll make sure to stop by, not too far from you. Yeah, well, I'll make you come down, right? Yeah, <laughs> um, you know, we we're just talking about recently how you uh, were. You said you were doing singing, right, in Second City. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, how was your experience working in Second City? Because you know, Second City is very big company that still is running smoothly today with new generations um, acting and um, doing all that kind of stuff. Um, what was your experience um, working on Second City? Well, um, 
I was at Second City many years ago. 1978 is when I auditioned and got in, and I started touring with the Second City National Touring Company for about five years. Wow. And then after that, or no, no, from sorry, for about three years. And then I got in the resin company, and I was in that for five years. So I got that mixed up. So I toured from 78 through to 82, 83 in there. Um, so three plus years. And then I got in the main company, and I was in there from. And the whole goal at Second City, first of all, is, well, for me at least, was to, <laughs> I started there when I was 22, and um, it was my first real gig. And um, at that time, you know, you could just audition and get in. Now there's this whole matrix of, uh, of uh, training companies and all that stuff. It's, it's, yeah. it's become much more stratified and much more successful. The time I was there, it's not that it was unsuccessful, but it was a smaller mom and pop operation, literally run by Bernie Solons and, and Jane uh, Bernie Solon, Bernie Solon <laughs> and Joyce Sloan, my two producers, and Bernie's wife was Jane. That's why I said that. And uh, you know, it was a really, really neat experience. Except that it was also ball busting and tough, and people were not necessarily pleasant. And a lot of people are in their 20s and they have their knives out and they want politically and, and uh, well, politically and also artistically to get ahead. Right. So, so, you know, and also it depends on how much talent, i.e. how funny you are and, and who likes you, who doesn't. Mm -hmm. it, was, um, it was a really good experience overall. That's there, great. Were, um, there were difficult times and there were negative times and and I can't say that it was all, you know, Garden of Roses, because it wasn't. But then um, you mustn't expect an experience like that to be. I mean, it was a really hardcore learning. I have some friends from those days, a few, not many. Um, you know, we went through the wars together. But, you know, sometimes when you make friends in, the, in those times, and then when you make sort of not friends, I wouldn't say enemies, but people that you, you know, are not in, in simpatico with. Right. Um, sometimes those rivers can run deep and you can not be simpatico with them many years later. Mm -hmm. But, so I you know, I, you know, I run into my Second City colleagues and, you know, a time we're, we're not now in our 20s anymore and, and we're a lot more, and, you know, those who are established and those who have done well and uh, don't have to. Um, because they don't have to strut their stuff, Peacock stuff, style anymore. Right. You know, I'm sure it was a great experience too, like just like learning experience wise and learning. Um, but um, yeah, how long were you there for? I was there for eight years. Oh, wow. I was there basically as my 20s there, from wow. 22 to 30. And then um, I, I uh, started doing a lot of. Um, commercials in Chicago and then I stepped up and started doing a lot of small parts in movies and then larger parts and that's when I did in Chicago 16 Candles and Breakfast Club and uh, I did a few other films, a film called The Naked Face. <laughs> I also did Weird Science which I was cut out of. No, no, Weird Science I was in but the Ferris Bueller's Day Off which I was cut out of. So I did a lot of stuff locally. I think I did about nine or ten movies in and around Chicago and New York, because our company went to New York. Oh, wow. Did a couple of films there before I came to LA, before I came to Hollywood. So. Right. Wow. Because That's my awesome. whole thing, Stephen, was that I didn't want people, I didn't want to, um, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't want to come to California and, and sort of let Calif make, allow California to validate me or, you know, let it be the uh, place where they say, well, you're an actor. I said, no, no, I was an actor before I came here. Because um, this place can tend to grind you down, so. Right. And because um, you were saying that you filmed a lot in Chicago, were you living in Chicago at that time? Oh, yeah. I lived in Chicago for 78 through 86 wow. with a stint in New York. And then in 86 or so, I moved to uh, California. Nice. Well, that must have been handy filming all those projects while you're in Chicago, while you live there. So it's well, it was uh, fortuitous. It was fortuitous because the fact of the matter is people weren't, you know, hitherto at that moment, you know, they weren't making, Chicago wasn't hot and the whole John Hughes phenomenon, it was just the time was like, there was this sort of Balance. zeitgeist and wave. 
I mean, the actors that I started working with in Chicago at the time, not necessarily at Second City, were like Gary Sinise and John Malkovich and um, Joe Mantegna and, uh, you know, a whole host of people at Second City. It was really a, it was really quite an exciting time. Right. Sure really it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always say, I always say, I wish I lived through the 80s because I really do think that was like, um, one of the best times to be around. I think the operative word there is lived. I mean, there were a lot of people that I knew that uh, didn't live, make it through the 80s. So the 80s had a tremendous upside. And then there was a lot of stuff going on where people were like dropping like flies. And of course, it was drugs or, you know, lifestyle choices or whatever. Right. You know, there, there was AIDS devastated a lot of friends I knew and people I knew. And but that was very big at that time. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, it was um, it was horrible, mm -hmm. and um, so there was a lot of horrible stuff. I mean, there were people doing a lot of cocaine and other things and dying, like John Belushi, and so it was it was there was there was a lot of there were a lot of peaks and valleys, and there were a lot of wonderful peaks. I mean, the '80s for me was a very big learning decade, and my goodness, I mean, you know, I did a lot of good stuff. Right. Well, like, speak about the A's, because, yeah, you did, like, 16 Candles, Breakfast Club, Weird Science. Um, how was your experience with working with John Hughes? Productive. I mean, John was a really, really um, big, big fan. Um, when he's a big, when he was a big fan, he was a big fan. When the light shone on you, it shone on you. And, indeed, it shone on me for, like, four films. Uh, you know, I did Ferris Bueller, and for whatever reasons, they this whole sequence <clears throat> that I was in sort of didn't pan out sadly because i would have loved to have been in the final film but that right. said um every experience with john was was intense it was quite um filled with a lot of uh, uh you know there was a lot of um i would say there was a lot of uh, creative energy and the high energy there was a lot of focus there there was a feeling that you were doing something that was really cool um but that was always my hope. I mean, I don't phone it in, so I do that with every thing I do. And uh, he was also really, really great in terms of, um, you know, um, expressing his loyalty. And, and when you when he liked your work, boy, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, for him to keep um, bringing you back for all of his projects, you must have been doing a good job, and you were. I, your parts in those movies, like. Um, they're kind of key, like they're smaller, they're small parts, but um, you know, you add some humor in a lot of your parts, which I like. And um, he was, he did, he did a good job casting you with all those films. Well, I try to squeeze, I try to squeeze it in. I mean, you know, part of the gig in those days too, when I was starting out, was I just wanted to be in film so badly that, you know, how do I do this? How do I, you know, make a character that's lasting? And as you said, the parts are not that sizable. So given what you've got, how do you do it? Right. So, um, there. You proved it. And do you have like any funny moments that happened all while filming with any of the John Hughes films? Well, the only one that, um, I recall that I've said, and it's not particularly funny, uh, is that I did not, I did not know who these actors were that I was working with in terms of their pedigree or they were all Los Angeles actors. And I was at that time a Chicago actor. So, um, when you're doing the, um, when you're shooting a film, you have to do various things. You do master shots and different sh shots. And so when they were coming around as it were, was, because I was shooting in this, we were shooting in this, uh, room that was the library and all right. the students were in front of me and I come in and, um, so they shot all their stuff in the morning, you know, Molly and, and everybody. And, and for those of those students or those of actors who were not of legal age had to go in the afternoon and become students. They had to go to school. Oh, I so see. They did half days in school. So what they do is they would stick their stunt doubles mm -hmm. or, their, or their, not their stunt doubles, but their stand-ins right. in, in their positions. So people that sort of looked like them that were, you know, that were, doing the, the measuring and stuff. Stand-ins do a lot of the stuff when they're setting up a shot. They uh, stand in for the actors and they're approximately the same size and coloring. So they're very similar. 
so we had a Molly stand in and uh, there was a Anthony Michael Hall stand in and um, but but uh, Emilio and Judd were over 19 they were indeed in their 20s so they didn't have to go to school so they were there for me in the reverse shot okay but when I when I would say they were there for me they were kind of goofing off so they're close <laughs> up on me and this is like my third film or something so I'm not really really you know um, you know, I'm, I'm nervous and I'm working at it, which, you know, you don't mess with actors for the most part anyway. So these guys are stuffing pencils up their nose <laughs> and cross-eyed and doing all these googly faces while I'm doing my close-up. And it was kind of fun, but it was also very distracting. Mm -hmm. And so at one between one take, I just sort of said, you know, you guys would have been great working with Martin Sheen in Apocalypse Now, and there he has a heart attack, and you guys are stuffing pencils up your nose, and, you know, he's really having a heart attack, and you're just, you know, oblivious to it. And with that, Emilio's face went <laughs> absolutely white, and I didn't know why. And then John Hughes came up and whispered, whispered in my ear. He said... Um, you know, Emilio Estevez is Martin Sheen's son. <sighs> oh. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And I wasn't saying anything bad about Martin Sheen. I was just saying the poor guy's having a heart attack and you guys are not coming to his rescue. And kind of like you're kind of not coming to my rescue right now when I need you, was my metaphor. Oh. But that said, Emilio didn't really take to what I was saying. Mm -hmm. He said it deliberately. Oh, no. And, and uh, to this day, the... I don't think that he harbors any, you know, fantastic feelings towards me. Oh, no. no. That's kind of funny, though, but neither of them. I think it's very funny, but, you know, it, it got them to sober up, that's for sure. Right. <laughs> so, like, when you were filming, did you, because you're saying that, was Ali uh, at age or was she too young, too? No, I think Ali was um, in their 20s, so I didn't, I neglected to mention her, but I think it was basically. She may not have been there for another reason because she was just stepping out. So, because right. I always only remember those two guys being there, so they might have had her stand in, and and she might have you know been I away see. for another reason. But I think that she was over the legal age at that point. She didn't have to do school. I but see. you know, I I didn't have a problem with their stand-ins being there because they were right. visually the same, and they didn't say anything. And all I needed was eye lines and connection. Right. So when so you shot those films, then, actually, I would have preferred their stand-ins to be there. But <laughs> I was gonna say, so when you shot those films, then um, it was um, what's it called? A cut screen. So it would go to you, and then it would go to them when it's there, like when it shows students. Like it, w it was a cut scene. That's why, like you're saying, because you didn't get to work with um, the others, right? When you shot your scenes. Oh no, no, I did. I did get to work with them. We did the master shot and stuff. All I'm saying oh, is. Okay. When when they yeah, come, the when exit they come too. around to do my coverage, they step out of the room. You see, you're I shooting see. for a full day. So you're shooting for a full day, and when you're shooting with minors, they have to shoot minors for only a certain number of hours, and in the morning. Oh, gotcha. And then, then the minors cannot work over, I think, three, four hours in a row, and then they have to go to school. I see. So it, okay. It's very, very strict rules when you're working on a film set. Right. So what they do is they structure the day so that when they come around to do my coverage, as we call it, my angle in the shot because i'm acting with them but when right. they come around to do my coverage that's when they send them away and go to school for the afternoon i see okay so you did get to shoot with them there then like all that well, stuff. well I, I, I did get to shoot with them there but very um, cool okay but what happens is that the just that's why they were sitting there and their extras their standards were sitting there while i'm doing my um close-ups interesting hollywood magic <laughs> so they say so they say. I'm gonna go in the chat quickly, answer some questions here, since we're on the topic of Breakfast Club. Um, let's see, someone says the 80s was an interesting decade, always fun to look back at. Wasn't as interesting while you were in it. Um, then, oh, okay, here's a question we have. Um, what was it like working with Anthony Michael Hall during that time? And plus, you also got to work with him again in de The Dead Zone. Yeah, you know, I have to say that Michael was and is um, a very interesting and intense human being, very, very funny. Um, at that time, he was like John Hughes would, they were like two peas in a pod. When I met him on 16 Candles, 
They were so synchronous. One would finish the other sentence. They were funny and they were in each other's head. And uh, I think he's really, really funny in that movie. Uh, I think the movie's got some issues every now and then, but I'm not a big fan of the long duck dong stuff and all that. Um, but I find uh, whoever said the 80s was an interesting decade and you know not as interesting when you're in it, well, that's kind of the way it is all the time. Right. Sometimes you really don't realize I how interesting it was because I, for the most part, thought the 80s, I mean, I was really not for Ronald Reagan, so there was a big part of me that really didn't like politically what was going on in that world, as I do now. I do not like now, but um, it was, for the most part, um, um, we're talking about uh, the relationship between Michael and John, I think, was very intense, and the upside was that they got a lot of work done. The downside was, I think, that when they stopped seeing one another, John was pretty unequivocal in his breakups. So um, I don't know. When I saw Michael in the dead zone, he hadn't had much communication with John up until that point. And John hadn't. Uh, John was alive at that point. But, you know, um, it, it was, uh, you know, we got the work done at the time. And I think that right. that's, that's what's important for the audience. So Exactly. Very interesting. You know, we're just talking about the Dead Zone because um, we've done a lot of other like TV series. Um, you worked on Seinfeld. By the that was hilarious. I watch mm -hmm. Seinfeld all the time, but um, Kramer's character and uh, your character is very interesting too. <laughs> and um, you know, how was it working on Seinfeld? Because you know, that's like one of the most popular sitcoms. Well, I gotta say, um, it was the most fun and also most difficult. I mean, it was fun because. Um, you know, it was so uh, such a great show to work on, and it was so funny. The whole sequence I had to do with Michael Richards was very, very difficult because um, Larry David said to me before we shot it, you really, really have to keep a straight face here, and you cannot break up because of what Michael does because we don't know what he's going to do. Oh, he, did he improv then? Totally. Wow. And he said, whatever he does... If you laugh at, you're going to break the take, and we won't be able to use it. So you've got to just stay strong and just watch it all go down, and then stay in character. Now, um, I've got a pretty good stone face, but usually I'm the kind of the goofy guy in situations like that. So right. this one, was, this one, I was a straight guy, which I was fun. It was great to do, and um, you know, something that I'm not totally unfamiliar with because I've done it several different ways and different times. Um, <laughs> so if you can picture it, as I'm looking at you now, all the cameras in the audience are to my left, and the stage and everything is to my right, and I'm sitting here at the bar, so I'm basically all the to my my body left is mostly to that side, and Michael Richards is upstage, and he does stuff like he puts a cigarette in his mouth, and then he drinks a whole beer with a cigarette in his mouth. The bar, the bar. Uh, thing opens up and hits him in the head, you know, when she's going to... That, so back. funny. And all that stuff was not in the script. I mean, I had no idea that, A, it was going to happen or that... And the audience is going ape shit, right? They're going crazy. Yeah. And even the camera guys are, like, chuckling, trying to keep the camera steady. You know, they're holding the cameras. Yeah. Uh, in the corner of my eye. And all I can do is hear Larry say, do not break. And the stuff is gold, right? You know, they're going to use it. It is. It's hilarious. He's not, he's not going to do it again. And if you see me like <laughs> guffawing like I'm Tim Conway on the Carol Burnett show or something, like that's just not going to sell. And they're going to get pissed off. Right. Um, and more importantly, and they're not going to get the, the good stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I thought that was like, – I don't know how he kept a straight face. And he well, started I'm telling you, you, I'll tell you how I kept it. <laughs> Through the whole thing, I decided – I had to do something, so I bit the inside of my oh. upstage cheek the whole time. Now, very subtly, you can see maybe my jaw clench every now and then. Right. Because when you, if, if you were to see it, I notice it because it's me. But I, when I went home that night, I looked inside my cheek, and I had taken a chunk out of the inside of my cheek just to not laugh. So that's wow. how I did I mean, I did it by, you know, force of conviction, but also when it got difficult, like mm -hmm. when he did stuff that was like, you know, 
I watch it here. I watch it to this day. I watch it to this day, and I don't want to laugh because I think you know I'm going to ruin it. And now I'm in the audience. Yeah. No, that but, part when he's chugging the beer and the cigarette, so funny. Yeah. Precious. It's funny, and um, you know we've had other roles too, and like. Um, Modern Family too, which is very cool, and a lot of other like Pop. My brother, he loves to show suits, and that's shot in Toronto as well. Um, yeah, you know, how, how, how was your experience working on all these shows? And like, do you have a favorite role you played in um, TV series at all? Um, not really. Um, I, I mean, I like them all. I'm never really in long enough. I enjoyed Justified because I had eight shows on that, and I got to develop something. If you get to develop a character, if you come in and do a stab in, like I did in Suits, a couple of episodes, it, it's not that it's bad to do that. It's fun. But, you you know, again, the word is development and, and being able to sort of, you know, inhabit the character. Right. So I'm good at coming in and doing a one day or this and that. And it's, um, you know, I've done that for years and uh, pretty much have a big chunk of my career is doing stuff like that. But... Um, to be honest, to be able to open up and fulfill, I mean, to open up a character a bit more is more fun. That's why the stage can be more exciting. And also film, like this movie Love Shot, where I have several scenes where I can bust out the character a bit. And that's why, going back to what you're saying, well, when you have small parts, you know, you manage to infuse humor in this and that. Well, you do what you can, right? Right. So you put in too much because you don't want to be a showboat, and you also have to serve the character in the time. So... Um, it's always more favorable to get a longer arc. So if I was to say what my favorite, I mean, the, the cutesy line would be my favorite role would be the next one. But um, I can't really think, as I said, honestly, I mean, outside of Justified, I've enjoyed all my, my TV roles, but you know, there's not one that really pops out to me that, right? you know, um, Actors, actors just want to do more, <laughs> and, I, and I'm no That's exception. True. That's true. No exception. Just show me, you know, show me where, where I start. Right. Well, um, is there a difference to at least, because um, you know you do a lot of movies, you do a lot of TV um, series. Do you find that there's a difference or one that you like better doing? Do you like doing movies or films better? Like, sorry, mo movies or TV series better? Well, it depends on the type of movie. If it's a low-budget movie, it's got a rhythm and a fast pace to it because you're only shooting maybe 15, 18-day schedules. I mean, really slow, slow schedules. Larger films tend to be a little bit fatter and more lethargic in terms of the shooting schedule and the way it works. Um, the work comes down to being the same. Uh, sometimes uh, more bigger-budget movies have more um, time to do things, but only incrementally. Um, time is always a commodity when you're shooting this stuff. Right. And um, uh, TV shows have really strict schedules. So they move at a pace. And they've got, you know, if you're doing a show like NCIS, boy, you're, you know, or I've even done soap operas, which are really interesting to do. I, I'm glad I did them. I don't know whether I'd want to do them again. I probably wouldn't. But, um, you know, you're really entering into it. It's sort of like, uh, <laughs> it's sort of like being at Eaton's or one of the big stores, uh, department stores where the revolving door is and you just have to get in at Christmas, you know, where it's going around real fast. And that's right. kind of the way it is on a film, on a TV show, because you're just really keeping up with the crew. The crew knows one another. The cast knows one another. You're coming in. Hey, John, how are you? You sit over here. Okay, let's run the scene. Shoot it. Boom. Thank you. That's great. Let's move on. So it's got a... It's a little bit more workaday feel to it. Right. Um, you know, independent films, depending on the role and, 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 and the whole the synergy that's there, I mean, you can spend a lot of time on it. So, I mean, a lot of intense time on it, even if it's a day spending it on certain things. Uh, but I would say the experience overall is, is in, um, when I worked on a movie like, let's say, Legally Blonde, you had 10, 15 producers crowded around a video uh, monitor to see what was doing, and the poor director, who um, did a very serviceable job, barely could have got to do his work because there are so many people hands-on. I prefer to work in an environment where the director is much freer and doesn't ha is unencumbered by that right. that patina of um, you know authority. Mm -hmm.
And I think you get better work out of that. Right. And like you know, in, overall, like, like in Legally Blonde, trailer. Stephen, Legally Blonde, they made me come out of that trailer. You know, I play the trailer park trash guy. Like yeah. 30, <laughs> like 35 or 40 times. Wow. I mean, you know, like, uh, you know, they, I did it strong. I did it weak. I did it angry. I did it cool. I did this. And then every time they came up, oh, try it a different way. And every every way I did it, I sort of sold it. So they were they were never sure. It's it's always tough whether it's a big budget or a TV show. It's always tough to work for people who don't know what they want. Right. It's better to work for people that go, ah, oh, that's what we want. That's what we like. And sometimes the um, the difficulty or the fuzziness can come from people that are not exactly sure as to what they need and want. And um, sure, it's that, a long I, one. I'm I, sorry, it's Sunday morning and I haven't had too much tea, so. That's okay, I was gonna say I agree with you there because I mean like, I mean, I used to do a lot of drama uh, in like in high school and stuff. And when you have your own type of style of playing a character, it goes by faster because when I guess when you have someone telling you, okay, oh, you do it this way, can you do it that way? it might not be as enjoyable for you and it might feel like force. So if like a person like a director or whatever lets you um, do what you want to do and play around with the character, I think it's more enjoyable. Well, it's acting by numbers, but also it belies the fact that they don't really have any trust in you. And when you work for people that don't trust you or at the at the end of the, you know, the, the P underneath the eight mattresses as well, you know, we could have gotten somebody else. I've been in only a couple situations where only a couple, where um, maybe I was a second choice or maybe one of the people on the set is didn't want to hire me, but somebody else convinced them. And that's not always a comfortable place to be. Um, you always want to be where they go, hey, you're great. Uh, can you try it this way? I'm, I'm not. I love to be directed. And uh, I think that good actors really can be directed. Right. It's oftentimes, it's sometimes how they talk to you. Um, some directors don't know how to talk to, you know, I've directed and there are certain actors that it's very difficult. You have to learn how to talk to different actors. I mean, to actors who are different styles in different ways. And even, uh, well, in my situation, I found it difficult too. So, right. Because you just want to say to them, oh, just do it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. We got, I'm looking at more questions here in the chat. Oh, there's a good are question. Are you watching this thing or what? Yeah, we have a few people watching. Um, you and like one, two. Uh, it keeps jumping up and down. It was, um, we're, it's at two now, but it keeps jumping between two Good. and two five. Like but there's a lot of questions coming in. Sometimes it's just um, it's okay. watching you delays a little bit. You have to, it jumps up and down depending. Um, it says, okay, here's a question. It says in the chat, is there a character that you're recognized for in the public often? Oh yeah, it's Carl the janitor, and it's maybe Seinfeld, <laughs> and it's also probably uh, um, well those two, those those two I think would max it out. Nice, Carl and, yeah. Depending, <laughs> depending on how, you know, some people go, "You're Carl the janitor." Now <laughs> they look at me and go, "Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's me." <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, for the most part. Very I mean, cool. It's, it's. I always find it a little bit odd. I mean, I love the part. I love the film, but you know, I've done a lot of other stuff. Oh, Legally Blonde, I'll get something for um, the big movies, um, like that. Right. Very cool. I have a funny question here in the chat. I'm guessing because they see your guitar in the back. They say, "Do you ever take that SG and do the Angus Young duck walk?" <laughs> 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 Yeah, you want to see me? Um, <laughs> I used to, but then I got I, I messed up my back. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> no, I, I'm I know I just the SG is uh, is it's actually my uh, my one of my so many guitars. So I haven't done the duck walk yet. I'll I'll, I'll work on it. You'll work on it. <laughs> I will. I promise. <laughs> um. Oh, well, like when you were growing up, I forgot to ask this earlier when you're doing Second City and stuff, but when you were growing up, did you have any inspirations or role models, uh, people you admire that made you want to pursue this career? Yeah, well, I mean, within Second City itself, there were a lot of people that were um, really helpful. Um, some of them are well-known, like John Candy. 
Um, John was a really wonderful teacher and, and a great inspiration and really, really um, a, a fan and championed my cause. Um, and then there was a fellow named Steve Campman and there were Peter Torque and a lot of people that worked at Second City. Uh, there were people that I held uh, in high regard like that. <laughs> and then there were also people at Second City, like Alan Arkin I always held up as being, you know, he started a Second City in the early 60s and um, now he's, you know, a much older man, but when he was a young guy, he was, he was quite the stuff. And, and, and even into his acting career in films, you know, uh, I don't know whether you know his career, but I mean, he did a lot of stuff. Uh, the Russians are coming and a lot of stuff when I was a kid, uh, the heart is lonely hunter, which is an amazing movie where right. he played a deaf person. And, you know, I just thought that uh, Alan Arkin was, well, that's the sort of person and career I'd like to, you know, emulate. There are a lot of people, um, you know, that you look up to in the business. Um, you know, whether you can recreate what they don't do, I mean, which is a fool's errand. You just look at their careers and you go, well, you know, I like that type of work. Right. But yeah, there were lots of people at Second City that I held in, in high regard. I mean, I really loved John Belushi. I, I mm -hmm. was disappointed when I met him because he was a drug addict. Oh, yeah. Uh, and. Um, that was a, that, you know, sometimes you don't want to meet your heroes. Um, uh, I met Bill Murray on, on Tootsie and he was totally uh, negative to me. And, uh, you know, that was a disillusionment and Dustin Hoffman wasn't much better. So, um, you know, I, I say that honestly with no rancor because mm -hmm. after a while, I still love watching Dustin Hoffman and I get a kick out of Bill Murray. But uh, it's like standing too close to a propeller sometimes, you know. Right. You, you, you know, I mean, I would hope that I'm not that strong T to certain people. I know that I've pissed off people and been in my own realm, you know, aggressive. So I get what these guys are, is that they're their own machines. Um, personally, I think they could have been nicer, but... Um, <laughs> That's too bad to hear. Well, it is too bad to hear. And, and, and I've gotten to a point where, it's, you know, in certain interviews, I mean, I don't, you know, are you taping this, by the way? Yeah, <laughs> we're live. Well, the future. Well, I have no, I have no problem. I have no problem saying that because actually, Bill um, over Murray has become. You know, he's got wonderful brothers, Joel and and Brian Doyle, who married me in Sixteen Candles. But you know, um, Bill's also you know a really talented genius. So, right. Um, you got to give people their due, and also, uh, um, he just didn't like me. <laughs> You know, it's like uh, that doesn't make him a total jerk, but right. in my eyes, it's tough when people don't like you. It and, is. You know, and I'm the type of person, I think, for the most part, that people either kind of really like or really don't like. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's showbiz, though. I mean, there's always going to be those people. Really. Yeah, and, you know, um, uh, there there's a whole cadre of people that that can be fans and, and cannot be fans. So, right. You know, you can't please everyone. And, and for someone like me who likes to please everyone, it's it's not an easy lesson. Right. You know, it's not. It hasn't. You know, Second City uh, and, and also show business, but, you know, because I moved beyond Second City years ago, is Second City is fraught with rejection. And, and you know, there's a, an expression. It's Hollywood is filled with all the people you hated in high school. So, um <laughs> you know that you run into people like oh you again you know that's a good expression actually I like that keep it yeah <laughs> it, ain't, it ain't mine so more yeah. more more questions from our yeah of course um let's see here um oh do you have like um I don't I don't think I've asked this already but is do you have a most challenging role that you've had to play that you've had the hardest time doing. Yeah, there have been roles that have been challenging, more in the drama vein, uh, less in the comedic world. Um, I, you know, I did a play called The Prince of Atlantis at Sagerstrom at uh, South Coast Rep a few years ago. It was a stage play, and that was intense. I wouldn't say it was hardest, but there was a lot to it that was difficult. I mean, physically it wasn't demanding. I did a play when I was uh, – I started a play and quit it when I was in um, – college called the brig which was about marines in a brig and they wanted the you know the marine we had to shave our heads and separate ourselves and the guys that played the soldiers or the guards were 
jerks and we had to do the, the and the director was really one of these method people and you know it got to be really intense so even at when we were out of rehearsal we couldn't talk to one another and all this stuff i actually hated that and uh, quit it for a lot of reasons because it messed with my head um and that's a big pet peeve because there are certain people that really like to mess with actors heads in a way that's really unhealthy right. um but intense roles gosh steven i mean i gotta go back and <laughs> review got your imdb um well yeah and and um you know there's intense i i think that internal affairs with richard gear was perhaps one of the more difficult roles i've had and also i would say i mean and it's not like I was slaloming down, you know, a Pike's Peak or something. And, you know, I mean, I did a movie called Snow Buddies, and that was challenging physically because I'm literally up to snow and I'm, with, I'm mushing dogs and stuff like that, and I'm doing humor. That was physically challenging. And, right. you know, I fell down the side of a mountain and all that stuff like that. Wow. Emotionally challenging and a bit physically challenging was the movie uh, Internal Affairs. And emotionally challenging and really was – and getting it right was the movie Deep End of the Ocean, mm -hmm. directed by Lula Grossbard with Michelle Pfeiffer. So, yeah, I would put those two in there. You know, after uh, I stop talking with you and two hours later from now, I'll go, oh, yeah, I should have said that. And I'll call <laughs> yeah. you back. All right. <laughs> well, those are good picks there. I mean, you know, there's always challenge, I think, with anybody. So, that's yeah, good. and also you got to realize that. Um, um, there are physical challenges and emotional challenges. Right. So, um, you know, a part on the surface might seem not well, that difficult but to me upon first blush. And then I'll go, oh, wait, there are layers here that, that are, mm -hmm. you know. Do you know, um, like, what, what has been the longest uh, shot project that you've had to do? Meaning? Oh, like um, working on television series or movies. Um, what out of all the projects you've worked on, um, what has taken the longest to shoot? Well, I mean, I did this series, TV series in uh, Canada called Forever Night, and I did forty-eight episodes of it, and I shot for two seasons. So we did twenty-four, one twenty-four, the other. I directed one and wrote one, and. But the thing is, we shot what I would call deep nights. We started, like, say, at one in the afternoon and shot till one in the morning. But then the schedule would slide. So for the most part, for about six, eight months, and even longer, nine months, we shot uh, from six, seven, eight in the evening to late in the morning. Wow. That was really tough. Mm -hmm. Long and, days. Uh, physically, that was, you know, you, you're talking about physical. That was, I think, perhaps over a long time, one of the most physically demanding because working deep nights, um, anybody who works in the post office, anybody's watching this that hasn't ha ever had to work a night shift can attest to that. And even what they call third shift workers, they shift them out after three, four, five months, whatever, six months. We were working nine months. There were, it was really, really tough. Oh, that's crazy. And it, and it's also really tough to shoot a scene where you've got to speak candidly and fluidly and do this whole thing. And it's five in the morning, four in the morning. I always wanted them to burn a little time code in, you know, say this was shot at 4, 4 a.m., you know. Right. With uh, five cups of coffee and a half hour sleep beforehand. So yeah, that's that crazy. Is, that, that, it is crazy. And, um, you know, they demand that. And, like, the, the last people at the end of the line is, like, you know, they're not going to they're not gonna ask the, the actors, well, when, what time of day would you like to work, you know. Exactly. Like, we'll work any time. And you know, there's always a, and there's another expression: is how do you get an actor to complain? Well, give him a job. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I got to work in the middle of the night. But that said, <laughs> that said, it, it you know, it didn't make for um, it was tough. It was tough. Right. But you know, you you take it when you can, right? Right, because you don't know when that opportunity is going to come back. The other time that was physically tough. Now you're asking me was I did this movie called The Relic, which is really not a very good movie. And, um, <laughs> I call it the smellic. And um, <laughs> um, we had to shoot, we had to get wet. I don't know if you've seen the movie. We got wet. I haven't, no. It, it was miserable. Being wet and in water, shooting in water, I tell you, you ask any performer, actor, dancer, writer, anybody, you know, writers, what do they know? Um, but water is effing horrible. 
I can imagine. I could imagine. Oh, and especially, you know, the longer you're wet and the longer, you know, you're in a tank or something. Now, I haven't done like you 571. I haven't done a submarine movie where I have to, you know, or a, like a film like Waterworld and stuff where, you know, you hear these stories. Right. And when the crew's in the water, too, you know? Mm-hmm. Now, yeah, I did that's shoot, that's a, sounds I did shoot it. Now, I did shoot in Hawaii, and you would think that Hawaii would be a nice climate to shoot in, which it is, but the sand on the beach gets into everything, all the camera equipment. It's right. just, it's just, you know, really, really it's tough. Pain. I'm getting tested. Who's texting me? Let's see. Oh, good. Buddy of mine. <laughs> good. I'm texting during the interview. That's all good, man. Um, I'm just going to throw the questions actually in the chat too. Um, so, oh, because you know, you, you do a lot of acting roles, but you also do a lot of, um, you've done writing and directing. Um, I saw on your IMDb. Um, someone in the chat says, Are you interested in directing again? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that would be my. Um... That would be the thing I'd like to do most, aside from making music and acting for the rest of my days. So yeah, and I've uh, I've got some projects and I've got some things that I'm you know are on the clothesline, so to speak. Very nothing cool. that I nothing that I can really talk about because it's kind of like in progress. But right, yeah, and and directing's where it's at in terms of uh, getting to 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 develop stuff. And the thing that really ticks me off is that a lot of actors, um, like Bradley Cooper, for example, directed Star is Born, like they get great ignored. Film. They get it's ignored. Great film. And they get poo pooed. Um, you know, Robert Redford, when he did Ordinary People, I mean, there are some really smart, good actors who have an eye for directing. Not every one of them. Right. I think that Jack Nicholson has made some turkeys. I mean, The Two Jakes is not a good movie. And um, so, I mean, there's some, and he's a great actor, but a great actor does not necessarily a great director make. Right. Um, because they're different skill sets. For sure. And also, I think sometimes the thing, the thing that makes a great actor does not serve a great director, i.e. ego. I'm sorry about this. Oh, it's okay. No worries. Um, so let me just tell my friend here. Hey, Zeke, I will definitely call you this afternoon. Very good. <laughs> See, that's exciting, though, for your directing. I guess people can keep updated with that on your IMDb and your Facebook page. Yeah, and, and, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to definitely um, let the world know when I do. There's something I really want to direct maybe this year, and we'll, we'll see. You know, the whole thing is um, having it on your terms, and and... I would rather make something that is small, significant, right. but insignificant financially in terms of, you know, $250,000, right. $500,000 movies. Because the more money you spend, the more you're beholden to the interests and powers. And also, the more they want to shape the product. So, right. Product. Good points there. I have a few more questions here before we end off, but um, I want to know. Um, because you work on a lot of comedies, but uh, do you have a favorite genre of film or television you like working on most? Wow, that's a good question. I guess, um, I guess, to be honest, my least favorite genre would be the procedural, you know, the sort of NCIS thing. And cop shows tend to be by the numbers. I do like good murder mysteries, and I love playing in those. Um, but you know, um, you know, I've played a lot of bad guys, and uh, and it all depends how it's craftily how craftily it's written. So, um, I think I don't know whether you my my favorite one of the favorite things I've done is Internal Affairs. Now you tell me what genre that is. I think it's a film noir. I think it's a '80s film noir. Now, film noir technically is, or films, well, not technically, but first of all, they're known to be black and white, but a 
color film, of course, can be film noir. But they're, the genre sort of, do you know that you're hip to the genre? I mean, it sort of started in the 40s and 50s after the Second World War. Right. The disillusionment of modern society, man against, you know, um, man against nature and his own nature. And um, uh, I really like dark satire. And um, like that, those are the ones that can readily come to mind. Right. I'm not... I'm not a big fan of doing action, but I'm not an action guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good pick, though. Yeah, good. I think those work. Um, dark comedies. I, mean, I don't know whether you've seen the movie Death of Stalin, but I really would have loved to have been in that one. I don't. Was it called Death? Of, what was it called Death Asylum? Death of Stalin. De I know. I have. I have actually haven't even heard of that one before. I'll have to yeah. look that one up. Check it out. Typing in. Go. Um, let's see. Interesting. I gotta check that out after here. And um, one film I want to talk about that came out, I believe, in 2017. That was shot in Toronto. Was The Shape of Water, and that one was very well done. And you were in that movie. Um, can you tell us a little bit of your experience working on that? Well, first of all, um, people really don't know I'm in it because they, you know, don't recognize me or don't know it's me which I'm actually kind of cool with. <laughs> um, I like that I because I'm serving Guillermo totally in his masterpiece, right. which, I believe, which I believe it's a modern day masterpiece and he's a modern day maestro. Um, my experience was short and sweet. You know, the one thing that Guillermo is really, a, well, he's all about detail and, and any great filmmaker is about the details. He is. Any any uh, any hack is not about the details, and uh, you know. So one of the more, you know, we spent. I probably spent just as much time doing a wardrobe fitting as I did shooting the thing, because wow. they put me in all these different types of clothes and layers of clothes and things, and you know what I brought to it, you know, came instinctively from that whole process. Right. And he uh, is a fucking genius. And he's also a really, really sweet man. And it really falls into the pocket of what I believe. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean he's not hard or tough or mm -hmm. uh, Sweetness comes from the fact that he, he knows how to, he knew how to talk to me as an actor. Is that uh, I think that um, Guillermo is one of these people who really knows what he wants really knows what he wants and um doesn't charge towards it like you know you you go my way or the highway but he's one of these people that really marshals people ahead um and again i worked with him for moments so it was just uh, ecstasy oh that's great to hear that he was a cool guy to work with though because yeah his phones well, I, are... really, I really i'm sorry but to cut you off but i really subscribe to the notion that good people are good to work with Mm -hmm. that's awesome um let's see here um one question i have for you because i you know i i want to get into the film industry i'm leaning towards um you know like directing and um editing all that stuff even maybe special effects but um what advice How old are you? i'm 20. oh dear child yeah <laughs> what advice would you give someone that wants to get into this type of work well my advice would be um, try to get into the um, exact place you want to be and start doing it. Now, even if it's not um, the tippy top, but let's say you want to do special effects, start working a special effects house. Because what happens is a lot of people say, well, I want to be a director, but I've decided to work as a driver. You know, nothing wrong with being a driver, but if you drive for three, four years, then you're known as a driver. Right. And it's hard to move laterally in the business. It's very strange. You know, actors have a tough time becoming directors. I directed my episode of Forever Night, and the, director, the Directors Guild of Canada, which I call the Directors Club of Canada, and I have no love for them, so I'll say this. They, they, they sent a note back saying, we really don't like actors becoming directors. Well, if not us, who? At least we should be in the five, top five or ten. So my advice to you is, Get into the position and stay there. 
because the cement hardens around you and people get to know get to know you as that and they go well Stephen, isn't he an editor he when did he become a producer now people do move laterally but you have to be really smart about it right if you are an editor that becomes a producer then but you know there are a lot of guys i know that just want to be editors or just want to be uh, producers or just want to be a grip or just want to be an electrician which is fine because mm -hmm. that's what you want to be so get in it and like it's like going to a restaurant and the, the waiter's a lousy waiter or waitress and and you go well, what well i really don't want to be here but you know i'd rather be a doctor well then be a doctor mm -hmm. don't, be a, don't be a lousy waiter right um you know be in the profession you want to be and you know let's say you decide you want to go into uh, special effects and it's not working out for you then make a quick decision go no it's not the department but don't don't try uh, don't have a hem and haw on it. People, right. other people will define who you are, and sometimes that can be more difficult. That's true. That's very so, true. You know, even your family, right? Yeah. You know, when, when people try to change within their families, like, oh, you try to lose weight or stop this or that, like, first ones to ridicule you are people, oh, yeah, look at him not eating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's me not eating. Yeah. So, Look at him, oh, he wants to be a director. When I told people I wanted to be an actor when I was 16, 17, 18, like I said, I think I want to be an actor. This is before I actually became one. Mm -hmm. My buddies, so-called buddies, all fell on the grass, I remember, the, and laughed for about 25 minutes, silly. What? That's so mean. Yeah. And then look at you now, you're, uh, you can Yeah, well, you know, but the point, wrong. Is, point is, I'll be honest about it, a lot of them don't look at me now. Because they've gone into their own lives and they still think of you as that. And they go, oh, when they see me, oh, that's just John. You know, the ones that care for you may. But, you know, you can't, you have to go beyond that. Right. You have to let people laugh at you and say, okay, well, forget it. <laughs> What's Stephen? Who does he think he is? You know, well, I think I'm, I think I'm all right. Um, and, you know, that's when the rubber meets the road. Because sometimes you have to stand up for yourself. Right. Be strong and choose what you want to do. Yeah. I've been looking into it. I've been looking up workshops in different places I can go in the area. Um, I actually, Handy, I work with a special effects makeup artist at my work. And she also, when she works at a place I want to get an internship at. So I have a connection right there. Well, I mean, do just, you know, that's the best advice I can give is just get into it and, and get into it solidly. And what I'm finding nowadays is people your age are getting into it young and hard and strong and staying there. So mm -hmm. you're going to have I a lot of competition. Yeah, there is definitely a lot of competition. I appreciate your advice, though. It means a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you, one of my last questions here was, um, what are some of your hobbies and interests outside of film? Um, well, where's my dog? Uh, she's from I love my dog, but I wouldn't say that's a hobby. I don't really have hobbies per se. I mean, I love to sketch, love to draw. I'd like to paint more. Uh, I, I, I write a lot of music. I read a lot. Um, uh, I enjoy gardening. Nice. Um, and that, that I love. Um, probably, you know, spending time with my family, my partner Heidi and, and uh, everybody there, her, her, her wonderful children. and. Um, God, you know, uh, probably, um, I mean, I love traveling and, um, um, that probably, you know, traveling and, and, and seeing things and, and being able to spend time with friends and family. Uh, right. I love my friends. It's like that. Nice. Sounds like fun. And, you know, one of my other, um, Am I pretty boring? I sound pretty boring, don't I? Well, it's still... I no, really it's have... fine. It's fine. You're, you sound like a sociable person. I mean, like, right now, I appreciate you being on the show and socializing. So, I mean, you must have a good social life with friends and family. It's good. I do. I do. That's great. I, I mean, they put up with me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, one of my last questions here, another area of work I want to get into. Um, um, how does one become a janitor? <laughs> <laughs> you want I to have to a do it. Technician? You want to become a because yeah. <laughs> you think I'm some sort of peon, untouchable peasant? You know what you should get is you should get the DVD extra of the Breakfast Club. 
uh, on the Criterion Collection because this whole speech I give after he gives asked me that question. Really? Uh, that was cut out of the movie, and it's got all those extras in it. So I tell everybody out there, get the Criterion Collection of The Breakfast Club. I wonder which one of this. I just picked up a Blu-ray of the anniversary edition. Yeah, well, the Criterion Collection's got all this stuff that John Hughes had on VHS. And my understanding is that they were going to do another one of a few other films, and the family is backed out. So this is a rarity. Wow. I'm going to have to get that and check that out. Very Pretty amazing. Cool. Pretty Very amazing. cool. And then also, if you want, you know, to live, laugh, and love. Get. No, don't get. The, no, get. The, <laughs> get to it for the room. Yeah, everybody. Get, links are below. Give so. it to your friends and family, you know, download it or, you know. Yes. Everyone that's watching, the links are below. Mm -hmm. Um, you get this really yeah. cool disc. Get the album. Oh, that's cool. That's a nice shot. I thought so. <laughs> and you know what? You actually have your own, um, like, um, I think it's a music label, right? You have, like, your uh, company. Carpuzzi. Well, Carp that's my own production company. Nice. Very cool. How long has that been around for? Um, for 40 years. Wow. Good for you. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Well, before I let you go, I'm going to, is it okay if I let you do a plug for the show? Sure. Let me know what you want me to say. All right. Just uh, state your name and say uh, you're watching Chit Chat and Geek Out on Geek Out Cinema. Hi, I'm John Kapalos. You're watching Chit Chat and Geek Out on Geek Out Cinema. Perfect. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, John, for taking the time to be on the show. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Well, back and at you. I hope your two followers go out and... Uh... <laughs> well, I'm sure you know, it's the afternoon, so I'm sure uh, once people are home, they'll re rewatch it. My, I'm, I'm, I'm happy just to do it for you, my my one follower today. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate it, and I hope you have a great 2019, and um, keep in touch. And for everyone that's watching, make sure to go follow John on Facebook, and uh, go check out his IMDb, and buy his new uh, CD, his album. Right. Take care, Take care. Have a good one. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.